It's just connecting now. I'm waiting for uh, to send Sarah the link. Okay, I'm going to go live. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to FTF Coffee Breaks. Thank you for joining us for today's episode. Our clearing house is safe for derivatives trading. I'm Maureen Lowe. I'm the founder and president of Financial Technologies Forum and the publisher of FTF News. And I'm also serving as one of your co-hosts today, along with my trusted and favorite Chief Content Officer, Eugene Grigo. You'll see that we are also joined by our special guest today. We have Lisa Cavallari from Russell Investments. She's joining us from the West Coast, so it's very early for her today. Uh, we also have Jason Rasnick from BNP Paribas and Richard Metcalf from the Worldwide Federation of Exchanges joining us in London. So we are representing three different time zones today. On this FTF Coffee Break episode, we are discussing what is a little bit of a controversial issue right now. Major financial firms and other industry participants have raised concerns about the potential concentrating risk of central counterparty clearinghouses, also known as CCPs. This issue is particularly acute for clearinghouses that serve the derivative markets. At the same time, market volatility, the pandemic, and the push for overall greater transparency has contributed to these concerns, underscoring the severity of the situation. So we'll be discussing all of these areas today, as well as how the CCP's clients and clearing members can better align what the regulators should be doing now to mitigate some of these potential risks and whether CCPs should have more skin in the game. So this will be a fun discussion to say the least, which I can already tell by the questions that have been submitted by um, the attendees already. Um, as you can see on that note, we are accepting questions from the audience today that we will be addressing. I will be handling those questions that are coming in from both Zoom and all the other places we are live streaming. So I will do my best to interject when we can. Eugene will be running the main um, discussion. So if you have a question, please do ask. It does make for um, a much more interactive discussion. And it's also your chance to get your questions asked about this very timely topic. Um, so we're going to get started shortly. But before we do, I just want the, the guests today just to go around and introduce themselves. So why don't we start off by Jason with Jason. Sure. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Jason Radzik. I run the derivatives execution and clearing business in the Americas for BNP Paribas. I'm also a uh, board member of the uh, FIA. Great. Thanks, Jason. Lisa? Hi, my name is Lisa Cavallari, and I am the director of derivatives trading at Russell Investments. Perfect. Thanks, Lisa. And Richard? Uh, Richard Metcalf, Head of Regulatory Affairs for the World Federation of Exchanges, which looks after CCPs as well as exchanges. Perfect. Thanks, Richard. Eugene, over to you. Okay. All right. As the industry uh, copes with market volatility caused by the pandemic, um, many major financial services firms have raised concerns about the concentration of risk among clearinghouses that serve derivative markets. Uh, major banks, buy-side firms, futures, commission merchants, and other industry participants are urging regulators and policymakers to consider making changes. Some of the industry are pushing for new risk mitigation measures for central counterparty clearinghouses, otherwise known as CCPs, so that they can better withstand major shocks to the system. Others are suggesting more, a more moderate approach. So during this coffee break, we will reach out to, uh, to the audience and get a sense of um, how the pandemic has impacted you. Uh, and we, again, we'll take, we will be taking your questions and we'll gather them and present them um, uh, during the discussion, uh, possibly uh, at the end of the discussion as well. But to kick things off, um, uh, what have been uh, the major impacts of the pandemic and market volatility on central counter party clearinghouses, CCPs, and their capabilities? Well, I, yeah, I can, I, I can start. Um, yeah, so, you know, the dust has settled for a bit, right? We've seen the markets get 
pretty quiet recently and for how much longer that really remains to be seen. Uh, we have quite a bit of unknown uh, in our near to medium term future. Uh, for example, will there be a second wave as restrictions loosen? Will there be a change in party for the US presidential election? A uh, lot of different variables that could really change and bring that volatility back. But what we've seen from this current quiet period, it's really given us a time to reflect on, on some pretty fascinating extremes that we witnessed uh, throughout the height of the pandemic, um, specifically in March. Uh, we saw the market be resilient, stand proud uh, through record volumes, massive and rapid swings and margin requirements. And oh, by the way, all while we were all pretty much transitioning to 100% work from home model. Uh, so that's not to say that there haven't been hiccups, right? And if I were to highlight uh, two topics that I think came up and that we've seen through the volatility and through these extremes of the market conditions, uh, one I think is that the industry really needs to invest more in strengthening the trade settlement process during market conditions. Uh, you know, various surveys taken uh, by market participants overwhelmingly, I think, uh, you know, pointed to this being one of the most uh, top concerning items during the height of the market volatility. Uh, and, and I think firms need to take this seriously. And I think, you know, one thing we need to consider is, you know, if we, if it, for those of you that have been in the industry a little bit, uh, you may recall uh, when we adopted fixed protocol, right? Uh, it seemed like a pipe dream to find a standard that the street would adopt to, but we did. Uh, and, and maybe it's time to start to think about as, a, as an industry in the street, uh, of finding a way to standardize uh, our end of day trade processing. Uh, there's no question uh, this would be a heroic effort, but let's understand that over time, you know, clearing members have, and executing brokers, by the way, have found multitude of you know, ways of, you know, um, customizing end of day files for clients, whether it's customized average pricing methodologies or uh, customized trade referential data. Uh, and all of this, by the way, while clients are diversifying properly, uh, they're executing broker base and they're clearing broker base, right? So you're, you're seeing how complex the system can get. And when there's a huge spike in volume in a short period of time, you can see why that can lead to, to a large amount of breaks that, that have to be resolved. If we were able to standardize that process, it could benefit everybody. Uh, clients will have so. more transparency. Quicker responsiveness on breaks and FCMs and executing brokers would see a huge reduction uh, in breaks, as would the CCPs, uh, and therefore the resources required to remediate them. So I think that's one very key topic. And the other thing I think we I'd suggest is is you know uh, the street needs bit better risk man management standards, right? We saw some pretty high profile clients cause some 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 pretty significant losses based on some extreme uh, strategies and. You know, we have to question, you know, the initial margin levels that clients have been able to achieve uh, versus their AUM. Um, and I think that that's something that uh, we definitely need to be looking at a little bit closer because if the volatility extended longer than it did, uh, that could have led to, to more issues down the road. Yeah, Lisa, thoughts? So I definitely agree with Jason. I think that the most recent volatility really exposed some inefficiencies within the ecosystem. What really resonated with this particular uh, global pandemic that we obviously don't have experience with <laughs> before, that's different from 2008, or at least based on my experience, is the unprecedented volatility and the swings that we were seeing and the amount of money that was going through the system. I mean, we might have seen wider bid ask spreads and a seizing in certain physical parts of the physicals markets, but the volume that was going through the deriv clear derivative space was based on my experience and I've been although I like to say I started work at the age of 11 and the, the, over my 30 years was really unprecedented. And I think we all learned that we had a lot, a lot to learn. And that goes to exactly what Jason was saying surrounding the inefficiencies. I mean, then you add, you add to those inefficiencies that many exchanges um, faced, for, you know, in, in Europe and in North America, and then the, some problems with give ups. And that has, what Jason was alluding to, and that has effects on every part of that ecosystem and is a domino effect. You toss that into a very volatile roll period for exchange traded derivatives in March, where people were just trying to catch up. And then the Fed cut rates, um, you know, for only the second time in history on a Sunday, which was almost exactly 12 years after 
uh, they did the last Sunday rate cut in uh, March of 2008. We saw that in, in 2020. So that was a lot. Uh, and I think that we learned that uh, the, the process is, is good, but I think we learned that we could make it better. And every person along that ecosystem has a responsibility to try to invest to make it better for the next time around. The other thing that I would note that was really interesting was, and I don't recall this happening in 2008, the, um, the circuit breaker, you know, many actually people many people don't realize that the derivatives markets, at least in, in the US when they were open, are not synced with NYSE uh, 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 circuit breakers. So it's 5%. So on that Sunday, when you were ping ponging between volatile markets, once NYSE opened on uh, Monday, the uh, 16th, it, that's a se it's a 7% swing. So you see some, that's how volatile a period we were. We were, it, it, was, it was just really extraordinary. So I, th I think I'll end it there by saying that I, and I hope that I've made the point that I definitely agree with Jason and was getting more descending into the particulars of some of the inefficiencies that we learned that we'll, we'll have to deal with uh, so that we're ready for, for next time. But, but quickly, Lisa, what about his idea for a standard for end of day? I, I, I love it. Um, it. You know, I can't speak to other asset management firms, and I know that I work, we, Russell works with BNP Paribas as, as an FCM. So I know that we are continually, as a buy side, on, at least from where we stand, continually sending out intraday files. Um, but it took us a while to get consistency across our FCM panel. So I definitely think that what Jason said about consistency and standards as well. However, I would also say that from Clearinghouse's in, in the products they support and how they support them, we need consistency with the FCMs in, in matching that and then providing that to the buy side, right? So it's not just what clearinghouses and exchanges can support, does the FCM that you choose can support that? But I'm definitely in favor of, of what, uh, I think we have a lot of wood to chop there and Jason's absolutely right. Okay, and Richard? Yeah, that, that's a great point actually, just to quickly add uh, on top of the, because you're right, there's a variety of different feeds that are coming in from the CCPs, different formats, different timing, different expectations. And I think that's all part of it. You referenced a perfect term, which is the ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a key component of that ecosystem that would need to be part of the standardization. Uh, again, heroic effort perhaps, but I think it's something that would benefit uh, all the constituents. And Richard, what do you think? What do you think? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would say that from our perspective, uh, one of the most pleasing things has been that we've had recognition from a number of regulatory sources that CCPs have done the job they were expected to do. That's not to, to discount the points that Jason and Lisa were making. I think they're very, very important, including, by the way, Lisa, um, some work uh, that we've embarked on on looking at how circuit breakers are calibrated, including that question of how they're calibrated across yeah. markets. So we'd be happy to be in touch further on that. Um, you've seen you've seen record volumes, as Jason said, which I think really underlines the utility of derivatives. This time, 10, maybe 12 years ago, there were some people calling into question whether derivatives had a legitimate role. And I think we've, we've moved beyond that and we, we shouldn't really underestimate that. Uh, particularly since so, at the beginning. Richard, what, what, so what is the answer then? You said that what, uh, to that question, what is their role? You're saying their role, is, yeah. their, their role is an incredibly important one in risk management, allowing people to adjust positions. I think some of the press tends to characterize derivatives as an all or nothing strategy rather than as part of a portfolio. Jason, Lisa, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I would say that as part of a toolkit, they have prove their usefulness. And I think that's a very important fundamental point that, you know, I would imagine we all have some common ground on. Having said we, uh, we ourselves as the World Federation of Exchanges have been using this expression of the ecosystem, not just in relation to derivatives or, or clearing houses, but across uh, all sorts of markets where we've seen that in odd little bits, maybe there's been a strain at one or more brokers, you know, not necessarily in the US, but other parts of the world. Um, and it highlights the fact that for any one node in the system to work well, you really want that to be that benefit to be extending out to the whole system. And there appear to be things that could be looked at, possibly in terms of international uh, standards from the likes of IOSCO and CPMI to just set what that standard should be. Um, the, the, the only other point I would like to make is that we we run a couple of groups which 
we were then in very, very close touch with once the pandemic market started behaving the way they did. Uh, we run one on cyber risk and we run one on enterprise risk. And we were very closely in touch with them to see you know, what their experience was. And it seemed to be that uh, in the case of the enterprise risk side of things, uh, uh, all the barriers has been that it's worked quite well, particularly this whole issue of moving to remote working with existing procedures. So without wishing to sound complacent or, or, or heaven forbid smug, we, we, we've had some good feedback on that. Cyber risk has continued, but it's been variations on a theme. There have been phishing attacks. They've just used COVID as, as the, the hook rather than you know some other thing that might catch the eye. Okay. So given that, that there are liquidity and margin squeezes caused by the market volatility, what can be done to improve the liquidity situation and what have been the impacts uh, upon best, best execution? So I think that, is that my question? Uh, who is that direct to start? I guess well, I, I, yeah, I, you I, can, yeah, yeah, every, anyone can answer, but yes, you can take the lead if you like. Okay. Sure. Uh, no, it, it's actually an interesting question. And, you know, it was highlighted by a, a recent survey that the FIA did. 76% uh, of the participants actually answered that, uh, you know, reviewing market volatility uh, and unpredictability uh, as a challenge needing review post-crisis. And, and I think that it's clear the majority of the participants recognize that there is a need for potential change. Uh, you know, one of the ways I think that that can occur is taking a look at CCP margin requirements. Uh, you know, our argument for quite a bit of time has been that margin levels when markets are, let's say, quote unquote, normal have been way too low. Uh, and, and this poses a couple of concerns, right? Because the first one's obvious, right? Extremely low margin uh, requirements uh, means potential flaws and risk systems, like I, like I mentioned before, you know, and those processes heightens the chance of there being a severe market impact. Uh, the second but a less obvious concern that we've seen arise during the pandemic specifically um, is when there are massive spikes in margin requirements in products in a very rapid succession in a very, very short period of time, um, you know, you can see how it can cause chaos in the markets. And, you know, it felt like, I, I don't know for you, Lisa, but it felt to me like it was a daily occurrence where margin requirements were changing across the CCPs and, uh, you know, for that short period of time. Uh, and this is something I think we need to do better. Uh, you know, conditions in less volatile markets uh, should be more conservative going forward so that we're better prepared for the volatile market conditions, especially those that come on unex unexpectedly. And it's not to say that Corona came on unexpectedly, but I think it's fair to say that how quickly the situation deteriorated came on unexpectedly. And, and, and that rapid uh, succession of, of, of changing margin requirements so often to such levels, you know, to me is something that I think we need to improve on. Uh, and it starts with looking at what the standard is during regular times. Uh, and, and it's really healthy, I think, to do a reality check here because you know, while we know that there were client defaults during this period of time, the market overall, like I said before, supported record volumes and margin, all while these large and successive margin increases were occurring. And that tells me something. That tells me the market can handle more conservative margin levels while not decreasing market liquidity, right? And that's the key point, uh, which is I think that that's a great way that we can be looking at how to improve uh, and how to counter volatility, how to counter some of the chaoticness of, of an unexpected market. But on the same token, I think there's ways to do it without it actually decreasing market liquidity. Lisa? Jason, I do agree with you in the sense that it's very, um, it was very telling that we did not have people pull back, uh, and this goes to what Richard had echoed as well, in their use of derivatives during this very volatile time, even though there were tremendous um, variation margin uh, you know, requirements that need to be met. When it comes to initial margin, I think there is always a creative tension when you're not, so if initial margin is low, as you say, coming into a crisis, if it starts to ratchet up or starts to, to increase and stays there, you know, you are, we did have many discussions with portfolio managers internally 
modeling what the potential variation margin requirements were, balancing that with how initial margin could be changing in the future. I mean, if you think about having the cash on hand available to post initial and variation margin, that is a portfolio management question that does demand greater scrutiny in periods of intense volatility. And we definitely saw those conversations increase because in some situations, the market was so volatile that you had to make sure that you had cash and securities on hand to meet those requirements. So while I agree with the overall um, point that you made about initial margins, and I think we can agree that potentially the market can handle increased initial margins, Assuming for the sake of argument that I'm not playing an ARB game and trying to move to a clearinghouse that ha offers a similar product and has just because it has a lower initial margin, you know, we have to balance that with the portfolio management that goes on at the at the portfolio level to make sure that there's um, that you're getting the most use of your cash and, and have that on hand to meet your your requirements. So there is some creative tension there that I also think deserves uh, acknowledgement. Yes, I, I, I think I think that's that's right. That there's there's a lot of a lot to be discussed in here. There's a lot to unpack, mm -hmm. as it were. Uh, for any one CCP, there might be a diverse uh, membership in terms of types of entities. Some of whom have different interests in in where IM levels are set. Um, a CCP has to balance some of that against its own judgment on, on what is or is not prudent. Um, it, the you know we, if we go back to basics volatility is not constant so what do you do about that that's that's kind of the, the question and i'm not sure that there is an exact scientific answer and that, that there probably has to be some element of judgment in it uh indefinitely and i think we can probably say that you know setting margin levels permanently at, at, at a, a level that reflects the peak of the volatility and when the VIX was, you know, as high as 2008 or, or, or nearly as high, you know, that's that's not the right answer either. That's mispricing risk on the upside. So, you know, you're then starting to get into some of these interesting questions about modeling. I, I've been struck by listening into conferences, uh, including an excellent one run by the FIA recently, uh, where one of the large FCMs was saying, yeah, they, they've got a much more formalized system now of trying to anticipate how much IM levels could go up, but but I don't I, I wouldn't want the the emphasis to be so much on IM when it is variation margin that's doing the bulk of the work. Um, so yes, I think there, there's there's a legitimate debate to be had, and I I, I think as an aside, no more than an aside actually, I, I think it's important that while CCPs broadly conform to the same standards internationally, the principles for financial markets infrastructures to be precise, there's also room for some independent thought so that there isn't too much groupthink as well and that you can have slightly different approaches. So, so for all those reasons, I think there's, there's room for an interesting dialogue. Um, ha having said which, you know, I would share the message that's come across already from, from the two of you, which is, look, um, the system actually performed very well so let's be very careful about trying to fix something unless we're sure it's actually broken and, and then, then be very careful about determining why it's broken. Because for us and in the papers that, that um, the, the FDF organizers have kindly circulated, you know, it's all about the incentives at the end of the day and we have to be very careful about those. Okay, and Maureen, do we have some questions from, from our audience? Yeah, we do. We, uh, someone's asking, do you recommend using multiple CCPs in the same way end users use multiple FCMs? So I can jump in here. So I, I think you're comparing that particular question is comparing apples and oranges, in, in my opinion, when the choice of whether or not you're using FCMs for many people could be a certain threshold in, in terms of asset size. And then the way you structure that, and how you make that decision can be very um, you know, not let's just let's just say that not every FCM is going to be so excited about being a quote unquote backup FCM, right? So you're either utilizing multiple FCMs or you're not for a variety of different reasons. On the CCP side, if I'm going to trade a particular product, it is more likely than not, and at Russell we trade over 130 different types of listed derivatives. It is more often than not that a particular derivative that we would like to trade has liquidity at only one exchange and one one clearinghouse. So while I understand the question is, 
you, you know, do, sure, you want diversification, not just, I don't, I don't want to say for the sake of diversification, because at an inherent logical level, it makes sense. But when you descend into the particulars of this question and this situation at hand, realistically, with most products, only going to trade where it is the most liquid and in most cases that drives you to a particular exchange and clearinghouse. And so I would flip that question around and say, how, what is the due diligence that is going on at asset manager level surrounding exchanges and clearinghouses that they are mo most likely to face? Um, how, are you, how are you as an asset manager, as part of that ecosystem, doing that due diligence, as well as your FCM is doing due diligence on you as a client, and clearly the clearinghouses have their own risk management um, principles as well. Yeah, and, and right, Lisa, that's a great point. And you, you don't have to, you know, don't look any further than the, the, the oil contracts listed on ICE and CME, right? <laughs> yeah. to, to understand that, you know, it, it, liquidity, uh, liquidity rules, right? And that's where clients are going to uh, go towards, they're going to go towards that liquidity. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy in a way, right? You know, as right. liquidity builds on one side, that's where all the liquidity goes. And so, I, I think that it's it's very different. The derivatives markets are very different than the equities markets, where you obviously can't see, uh, you know, um, you know, equities listed on multiple multiple different um, exchanges uh, and support that liquidity. Uh, it's different in the derivatives markets. And Martin, do we have any more questions from the audience? Could I just come in quickly on that oh. one? Because oh, I sure. Think, I think, sorry, Richard. Sorry. 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 But I um, I, I think there's another. A point here. Um, I mean, you, you do see competition between CCP sometimes, and that's particularly true when a, an asset class is emerging as clearable. We, we're seeing that in FX at the moment, which traditionally has not been cleared very much, and there's, there's a couple of people competing on that. Um, but there is a natural tendency, and I think it's I think it's not just about liquidity because you're talking also about the netting efficiencies. And one of Absolutely. the interesting things that we, we've, we've looked at is, you know, supervisors in various parts of the world have a legitimate right to look at whether or not the offering of clearing services from one jurisdiction into their own jurisdiction has prudential impact. Fine. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's um, you know, there can be disbenefits when you fragment netting sets. Um, people know that. And that's one of the reasons why you know, a lot of volume does co concentrate naturally at a particular CCP, and that's not always necessarily such a bad thing. Absolutely. Yeah, and, and I think, Agreed. by the way, just, oh, yeah, and I, and I think this ties in, right, by the way, to some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, right, around the margin changing so rapidly, right, uh, you know, in, in which case, you know, if you think about, uh, you know, the margin changing and not necessarily understanding why the margin is changing and you take in all those factors and you start to look at, okay, uh, what am I going to trade today? You know, portfolio manager might be stepping back and saying, I need to better understand how this is going to impact the market, right? That could impact liquidity too. So there's no question. It, it's, a, it's a little bit of a vicious cycle. And again, that's why we, we, I raised that and we've been discussing that as a key topic that we need to be thinking about. Maureen, I just want to check in. Do we have any? Of the, I have, a, of course, my questions, but do we have yeah, the, more? this came in a little bit earlier. I'm, I'm not sure if it's a, more, a little bit more of a statement or, or a thought, but maybe someone can comment a little bit further. But they're saying, can you discuss the fact that the FCMs are dependent upon exchanges for data settlement and risk calculations? Can anyone delve into that a bit more? Yeah, as an FCM, I, 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 I think I, I'm in a position to answer that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, look, I mean, I, yeah, that, and that was the point, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, Lisa and I were kind of uh, expounding on before, which is the standardization point, uh, you know, it, we, different exchanges have different cutoffs, they have different uh, data feeds, different frequency of those data feeds, different standards in terms of when those data feeds are coming. Uh, and it's not just about trades, right? It's about uh, exercises and assignments, right? It's about all the different activity that goes on margin, collateral, uh, and so when you start to think about all of the different feeds that we receive, and by the way, now all the different feeds we're sending out, right? So to go back to Lisa's term, that ecosystem, there are a lot of different moving parts, right? And they're all different and they're all customized and they're all unique and they're all specific. And again, that's the point. There's no standardization there. And, and we have no choice, right? We have to be able to take in all those feeds, regardless of what those differences are, format, cutoff, process, et cetera. Uh, and be able to handle it and then package it and then process that data back to our clients. Uh, and, and that's where you can see when things are in volatile markets, 
it just takes one little break in that chain uh, and it can trickle down to a much bigger issue. Uh, right. And so, you know, that's where I think we, we, we need to be looking at that, that standardization point. Uh, and again, it starts from the CCP feeds and the standardization there. But, you know, I'll absolutely take the onus that I think it also uh, stands on the FCMs and the clients to create that continued standardization process uh, from end to end. Okay. All right. So uh, <clears throat> getting back to the, uh, the, the pandemic and the lockdown and the economic uh, uh, disruption, uh, what are some of the long-term changes that may come for clearing houses? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's funny. I, I, I'll add a couple of interesting uh, points to, to a topic that we already talked about, but I, I think it, it, it's pertinent for this conversation, right? And I, and I think it's, again, it's one of those topics that's a little bit, um, you know, uh, divisive, right? But, you know, talking about the, the margin levels, I, I'll, I'll give you an interesting one. Uh, the S&P 500 uh, E-minis futures contract. So the IM at the beginning of the year started out at uh, 6,300 per contract. Uh, by March 2nd, it had risen to 6,600. Uh, over the next few weeks after that, it increased six different times, uh, ultimately settling at a, at a mere 12,000 per contract, <laughs> which is do almost double the amount of where it started at the beginning of the year. Uh, and, and again, you know, if you look at then corresponding to comparing Q4 uh, to end of Q1, so Q4 2019 to uh, Q, uh, Q1 2020, uh, you saw the number of margin breaches uh, more than double, right? And the size of those margin breaches were probably about three to four times as large than they were previous in the previous quarter. Uh, so there, there again, is some stats to kind of support why I just think that's one of those things to answer this question that we need to be reflecting and looking at. Um, but if we don't want to belabor just that point, uh, and, and just to bring a, another idea to the table, uh, you know, perhaps we can be thinking also about how CCPs, uh, you know, notify uh, and, and, and provide transparency around changes to the, to the margin, to the, any methodology, to their standards, to their rules, and to the requirements. And I think, you know, Richard was alluding to this a little bit earlier, but, you know, CCPs, I think, need to consider uh, providing a lot more transparency uh, and consistency in terms of how those rule, rule changes are, are, are disseminated across the industry. Uh, you know, if we think about, um, I, I think it was a, a recent uh, World Bank um, uh, assessment uh, that, that specified that, and it wasn't the FCM community saying this, that, you know, a lack of a public comment period for rule changes uh, is an issue, right? And that is an issue, right? Because uh, for multiple reasons, number one, you're not getting this huge community of, of participants who obviously can bring some value to the table in terms of, of creating better rules, right? And what we've seen over the last few years, particularly like with the CFTC and, and the regimes over the last two, uh, you know, two, two cycles have really been about collaboration, you know, under uh, Giancarlo and now under Tarver. So, you know, we, 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 we need to have more of that with the CCPs. And, and I think if we have that, uh, perhaps we'll have better and more consistent and more expected uh, rule changes. And I think mm -hmm. the second part of, of that as being an issue is when you're not uh, getting that, uh, you know, open public notice beforehand, it just comes at you. And now you have to scurry to understand it, to be able to adapt to it. Uh, you know, sometimes that, you know, you get these memos coming in uh, multiple ones a day from various different exchanges, interpreting them is not the easiest thing in the world. And so um, I think that we, we, we can definitely going forward, do a better job in providing transparency, but more important, collaborating on making sure that we're sharing that date, that the, 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 those topics beforehand and discussing them as a, as a, as a, keep going back to Lisa's term as an ecosystem. <laughs> Lisa, some thoughts? No. So I, I definitely agree with uh, with everything that Jason just said. So simplistically, I could just say ditto. But to 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 elaborate on one particular point, because you know, at the, the buy side typically interfaces with key partners like Jason's firm, BNP Paribas, as an FCM, and of course we trade a variety of different products with different uh, exchanges and clearinghouses. Something that we Two points to build on. First, you know, the cross-border harmonization of rules and regulation probably well serves um, everyone, as I'm sure Richard could expound on. And so I do think that that builds upon some points that Jason was just making. 
And I, I advocate, and this is a little bit different, but I'm just taking this off in, in a tangent. And, you know, at Russell, we make sure that we keep in touch with our exchange counterparts in the sense of the large exchange, not all the exchanges with whom we trade through our FCM or products where we trade, but many of the larger ones we do have, we value the relationships that we have with them to continue the dialogue about new new products, new services, things that um, they typically would like to solicit the buy side community, for example, on certain points. So I feel like, again, that, that ecosystem does need to be nourished, many satellites in it, right? And we all, we, we all are inter interconnected. I think the other, the only other point I'd like to make is based on what Jason was saying earlier, I think a key component in terms of when, when he was mentioning margin breaches or, um, and how that has ripple effects, you know, the custodians are, are a key part of this ecosystem as well, especially with the number of um, movements that we're going through the system in the, in the first quarter. And I, I, I think we, Richard went away and then I think Richard has come back. Yeah, I think he's on the phone. Oh, great. You, you have me on audio I, at the moment. I'm Excellent. very sorry about this, very embarrassing. Oh, okay. I, I think I can pick up. Um, yeah, it was, uh, the question is about long-term long -term effects upon the, the clearing house. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I think we have to be very careful about where we go with the, the whole uh, IM question. I mean, from my point of view, compared with a lot of the predictions that we saw, post the 2008-2009 reforms, where a lot of market participants were saying, oh, there won't be enough collateral, I won't be able to get to the right place in the right time. I don't think we're quite in that territory. I, I, I would reiterate my earlier point that you know, you, you will always have this problem as long as volatility is not constant, and therefore there will have to be some sort of element of judgment in terms of what the appropriate level of IM would be. And the efficiency with which it moves, with which it moves may be as much of an issue as, as, as you know, the levels that, that we're talking about. Um, you know, certainly but breaches don't mean that the CCP has failed. They, you know, you, the... the um, to quote, a, to quote another um, trade association, um, which put out a note on, on whether or not I am pro-cyclical back in April, is to said banks are having to apply multipliers because of market volatility rather than shortcomings in their models. Um, so, yeah, I, I think there's, there's, a, there's a healthy discussion to be had there, but I, I don't think we can, you know, draw any hard and fast conclusions. For, for me, yeah, actually, I, I'm going to come back to to something which I said earlier, also, which is, you know, we have to be we have to be sure that the system is broken before we go trying to fix it. And I would say that CCPs have done what they were expected to do. And in a way, for me, uh, all of these topics that we we touch around in CCPs tend to be interlinked. And when I mentioned incentives earlier, the part of the incentive game within a CCP is to have users put money on the table, they're on the hook for stuff, which acts as an incentive for them to, to you know, to, to monitor the way the CCP goes about its business. And, and as long as the CCP is clear and transparent about, you know, what will happen under which circumstances, I think you, you've addressed by far the biggest issue in, in the whole situation. But, you know, very happy to hear alternate views, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and quickly, I think Marion has a couple of questions that have come in. Yes, I think this is going to be another one for Jason. Are FCMs dedicating enough staff to meaningfully engage with CCPs on risk management development initiatives? Is there a CCP mole on this uh, participant? <laughs> I, think there, I think there are a couple. <laughs> there are a few. Common sense, Common sense question. <laughs> no, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, no, actually, the answer is, of course, you know, we can always absolutely do better. I think, uh, however, I will highlight a few things that I think are important. Uh, number one is, you know, leveraging the FIA, for example, there are a multitude of working groups that, that people may not be aware of that are occurring in, the, in this industry across operations, uh, across legal and across a variety of different topics where essentially um, there's a lot of market participant feedback gathered by the FIA and then the FIA acts as a liaison for the entire community because again, we as individual FCMs can interact with um, the CCPs, but a lot of what the themes we're talking about is standardization, right? And if every 
CCP is saying, this is what we think is best, um, but everyone has a little bit of a different perspective, right? That's not as fruitful. So, uh, you know, we, we do try to leverage the FIA as an industry to, to you know, culminate all that uh, information and in those, in those points and leverage, you know, organization like the FIA to be able to do that. Um, but I think also, you know, some exchanges do better than others. Um, you know, uh, some have quarterly, uh, quarterly meetings where all the FCMs attend and we talk about the key issues. Um, others you know, have open dialogue with senior management on a regular basis. So, so I do think we're having those conversations and I do think um, there's a, a very good two-way understanding of what the key topics are. There's no surprises here um, you know, about what the topics that come from the FCM or from the CCP side are that come up. But um, I think we can do better always. And, uh, and, and I think it starts with, as we get closer from just ideas and sharing um, high level ideas to actually formalizing it in rule changes, I think it's that part in the middle where it gets a little bit gray. Uh, and that's where I was alluding to before that we need to have, you know, perhaps more transparency and more discussion and dialogue. Okay. So uh, how does trading through a clearing member impact the current levels of risk or is there no impact at all? Yeah, Lisa, I'd like to direct that to you. So I, I, I sure, I believe that this question about um, clearing, what like self clearing or directed clearing versus using an FCM. And I have to say that at Russell Investments, like we are strong advocates of uh, utilizing an FCM. And although there have been situations where on behalf of a client, we've explored what it would take to self-clear at this point in time, and I'm using self-clear, even though it's for two in different machinations and in, in using different vocabulary, but we've strongly, we strongly understand and, and agree that FCMs are, do provide a service and that's a service for, for which they of course deserve compensation. The, what you're, where people like to explore that is the idea of what are they getting versus when they work through an FCM, they have fellow customer risk. And so I realize that every person or every individual client or large separately managed account or pension plan out there might have a different view on this. So I'm just speaking sort of generically based on the um, fund and third party client base that we have here at Russell Investments. But it makes the most sense to go through, in our opinion, somebody who's like an FCM, who's up to date on the, on the technology, the offerings, can, can expound on their relationship with CCPs and provide a broad diversified service as opposed to an individual potentially um, working that out themselves from the connectivity and the technology to the margin and the capital that's required to essentially self-clear. So we, we do see benefits, uh, tremendous benefits to, to basing and having key uh, FCM relationships. Now, having said that, all FCMs are not created equal and something that has received a lot of press in the last 10 years is the, the shrinking number of FCMs that we have in that ecosystem. And at Russell, we do believe in facing FCMs that provide the broadest and biggest um, product set. And Richard had, had earlier mentioned um, FX clearing, something that uh, many clearinghouses are, are, are looking to uh, have that robust offering. That's a wonderful example of, of innovation and a direction that I think the, the industry is going. And we like to keep our hand on, uh, on the pulse of that. And we also very much believe in cleared swaps um, trading. And so we will not face an FCM that, doesn't ha that does not have um, cleared swaps capability because we feel that since 2008, that's the direction that the, uh, that the industry is headed. So, and there is only a small subset of FCMs that offer a robust uh, cleared swaps offering, uh, including this shop, of course. So. I think I think we're down to 16 on the cleared swap side. And when you look at certain contracts like single name CDS, it goes down to 11. So yeah, you're right. Uh, compared to what about 53 uh, FCMs now that we're at um, on the futures and options side. Uh, again, that number from a much higher number, you know, 10 plus years ago. But but nevertheless, you're absolutely right. There's there's definitely less. Uh, uh, much more concentrated risk uh, when it gets to the swap side versus the future side. Mm -hmm. uh, Richard, are you with us? Okay. I, I, looks like yes. Richard Can is... you hear me? Oh, oh good. No, good, I, good. I, I, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I was just uh, prudently on mute. Yes. I mean, the, the, this is this is a very interesting question. The, the decline 
since 2008 and the number of FCMs has, has been pretty marked. Um, I, I, I did a quick calculation earlier, 60% by my by reckoning, yeah. uh, down from about 160 to 60. Now, not all of that, you know, some, some of that might have been natural consolidation waiting to happen. I don't know. Um, it, it's unfortunate that that's happened at a time when, shall we say, the economics of clearing have changed in some ways. You, you, you can't get much return on collateral, which is kind of like a shadow hanging over the, the whole um, operation. Um, in terms of the economics of it, the 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 predicament I think as some regulators see it is, is that if that trend continues, which admittedly you know it seems to have plateaued, but if it were to continue, what does that imply about you know access to clearing at a time when you're trying to encourage more of it? Um, so that that's led to us as the WFE in in the past couple of years. Um, advocating alongside banks and end users for there to be a better treatment of leverage within the Basel capital rules as they relate to um, customer segregated collateral, uh, which was a a strange and and pretty significant discrepancy in the overall architecture of the regulatory system. And it's understandable how it came about because there were important considerations relating to leverage, but a system that's more joined up and, and, and remembers the objectives to maximize access to clearing and, you know, certainly try to ensure that there's no further concentration uh, would, I, I think, be something that, you know, all of us would probably uh, would probably support. Yeah, and, and I, I fully agree, Richard. And I, I think it's, it's, it's a tough question, right, because we – uh, we see the numbers that have been shrinking. To your point, it hasn't been um, as uh, as extreme in the in, in the most recent years that it had been, you know, prior. But still, nevertheless, we still are seeing uh, FCMs leave, leaving the space. Uh, but I also want to go back to a point, Lisa, that you made, which I thought was very pertinent, which was about self-clearing versus uh, versus using an FCM. You know, I don't want to beat a dead horse on a topic that we've discussed over the last two years, but let's. It's been about the two-year anniversary, uh, roughly, of when you know, uh, one single um, self-clearing member on NASDAQ Nordic cleared out two thirds of the default fund, Um, you know, and so, uh, you know, and one thing we saw with what you highlighted, Lisa, in the recent market events is that the value of the FCM, right? Because you did see some pretty big clients take some pretty heavy losses, but that didn't disrupt the market because you had the FCM in the middle. Uh, and I think that's a really important point. Now, now having said that, uh, you know, it, it goes back to the more inconsistency we have in the trade freeze. I mean, all these things come together, right? The more, the more that uh, money has to be piled into doing things to try to create multiple to different standards is a good example of something that if we can fix, uh, then more time and effort and, you know, and, and focus can be spent on these other topics that I think we're talking about here. Um, just quickly, uh, how are FCMs currently surviving? How how are they, you know, how are they, I mean- No pressure, Jason, no pressure. (laughs) (laughs) Eugene. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, you look, I mean, this has been, uh, this has been, you know, uh, a strange year, right? Because uh, Mm -hmm. while in fact, it's been, uh, you know, quite, quite chaotic in terms of setup and teams being, you know, disparate locations everywhere. Um, the reality mm-hmm. is it's, it's, it's been a great year, right. In terms of, you know, supporting markets, um, you know, volatility has obviously tapered off recently, but uh, you know, most of us came through that period, um, you know, with a few wounds, but nevertheless, we were still walking pretty, pretty, pretty cleanly. And so I think that, uh, you know, I, I'm very optimistic about 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 the future because I do think that it, it um, you know, to a point maybe Richard that you mentioned before, you know, derivatives are here to stay, um, and we're seeing more and more and more clients leverage der- derivatives uh, in different hedging strategies uh, in, in a slightly speculative way, but nevertheless, different hedging strategies than your traditional you know commodity hedgers. We're seeing a lot of new types of clients coming in to provide liquidity. Uh, to provide speculation. We're seeing, uh, at least as you mentioned, continued innovation in terms of how do we uh, continue to expand on, on, on you know, cleared swaps. And so I, I, I do actually think that there's, there's a lot of, lot of reason for optimism. Um, and, and, I, and I do think that once 
the world settles on what is the new norm, um, you're going to start to see volumes come back up. You're going to start to see, um, you know, more clients get back to the tables. And I think Doritos is going to be a key part of that. And the FCMs are going to be a key part of supporting that ecosystem. Okay. Uh, so how would panelists describe the current situation with CCPs and the industry concerns over concentrated risk? And that uh, I will direct that to Richard. And then, you know, uh, let's get into the question of the moment. Uh, how valid are the assertions that CCP should have more skin in the game? But the first one, like, what is the current situation in your opinion? Hello, Richard. Are you on mute again, Richard? Can you can you hear that's me? That's the most pop. That's the most popular sentence in 2020. You're on mute. It, it, it's yeah. I, it, it, <laughs> there's going to be somebody printing a T-shirt on that thing. Um, I, 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 this was just to divert from the question, which I did. I no, I, I really do want to answer it. Actually, I, it comes back. Look, if, without wishing to sound a little too flippant, uh, you know, if if a CCP is not concentrating risk, it's not doing its job. Because that's what do you, you mean by that? What do you mean? Could you unpack that? What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that the utility. Okay, so the, the utility of a CCP is not just to be more credit worthy than any one participant. Important though that is, mm. it's to ensure that collateral flows and that resource, pre-funded resources are put on the table to back current mark-to-market exposures and potential future exposures. But a huge, huge part of the benefit is also the netting benefits that are achieved. Can you, and also the, the reinforcement of liquidity. So, so it goes back to a little bit about what we kicked around earlier. Can you get that perhaps in the future as more and more clearing happens? You know, there will be more uh, ability to uh, spread some of this across more CCPs and it's not it, it, it's it, there are competing venues for some products particularly the bigger ones or the potentially bigger ones but you know to, to go back to the, 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 the question for this whole panel session the question that, as we see it is is derivatives trading safe without CCPs and compared with the bilateral world I think what you've seen in policy terms is a deliberate and very carefully thought through decision, partly to reduce uncertainty in, in the bilateral market um, to, to move stuff to central clearing. So, you know, what goes with that is an ability to have a good oversight of the market, which no individual participant can have, which is why I think you saw a lot of nervousness around the demise of Lehman Brothers back in 2008 and the near-death experience of Bear Stearns when it was bought out by somebody else. So, you know, that's, that to me is the trade-off. And, uh, without, and I, I think you then need to start looking at what other concentrations are out there, including this question which we've just discussed very thoroughly about, you know, whether there's concentration in the FCM market or across the user base for any one CCP. Um, so th those are the sort of issues I think that we need to be thinking about. But to, to say that, a, you know, a lot of business goes through any one CCP, you have to look at it as a, as a cost benefit thing. I think that's, a, that's the most simple point. And that's not a cost benefit to the, the CCP. It, 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 or it is, I mean, there is some benefit to the CCP, obviously, but there's a benefit to the people participating it and a broader societal benefit. We, we often talk, and you'll see this in the, in the papers that we, we submitted, uh, for circulation that, you know, the, the CCPs and for that matter, exchanges generate positive externalities, which generate extra confidence amongst the wider user base, which frankly encourages participation, which I think is to everybody's benefit. I wholeheartedly agree with Richard, if I could just interject, I think he's as we're coming to the close of this hour, and I was reflecting on our, you know, the initial question associated with this coffee break, are clearinghouses safe for derivatives trading? Richard sort of turned that question on its head and I would like to reinforce that, that point. What, what's your alternative? If your alternative is bilateral OTC credit risk, it's just like you can, my wholehearted answer is, yeah, you can bet that clearinghouses are, are safe for derivatives trading because rather than managing 25 different bilateral OTC risks in a very convoluted way, in a, in a shadow, if you will, market, even though there's technically reporting to the regulators, it, it's much more efficient 
patient, and even if it's not, even if we agree that there could always be improvements, it's it's a viable, healthy uh, way and alternative to to bilateral OTC credit risk. And I think we're on a trajectory to get more things in, into clearing, and that is that is measurable. It's transparent. It's far better than than what we had prior to the global financial crisis. And I and especially with the UMR, the uncleared margin rules coming online uh, these next several years, I think clearing. Uh, will only continue to grow and in products that where we don't see clearing right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone wants to go back to the prior situation. That's what I'm learning. <laughs> no, and yeah. a CCP can, you know, a, C, a CCP can adjust for the degrees of concentration and distribution of risk. Um, and, and if it sees all the flows, then it, it is by definition better place to do that than any individual participant in a, in a bilateral system. Yes. So, you know, I, that, this, this is, uh, I think this is a big, uh, a big part of the cell of, of, you know, CCPs for, for okay. systemic and policy reasons. And then the, the big question, uh, uh, the assertions <laughs> of some people in the industry that CCP should have more skin in the game. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, do you want to? Yeah, do you want to go I with that? I think we, we know the I know we're heading into the clock. Yeah. So I'll. Uh, this is this is a topic that obviously could be discussed in an hour all by itself. So you know, I'll, I'll highlight a few things here just that might be interesting for people. Uh, you know, one thing to consider uh, is you know we we've been talking about skin in the game for for a long time now, right? And there's no question it's a divisive topic. Uh, there's varying opinions in terms of how much is the right amount. And obviously the FCMs will have a different perspectives than the CCPs and that's still healthy. Um, where, where I think we should instead be perhaps focusing on is the consistency, right? Uh, you know, if you look at, for example, CCP contributions to the default management waterfall, CME posts 250 million. OCC was at 6 million, now posts 54 million. Still relative versus the CME. Uh, and then if you look at that as a percentage, though, in terms of, uh, you know, contribution versus, uh, you know, member member contributions, you know, that CME two two 250 million is only 2.8%. Uh, OCC is 0.5%. But, you know, ICE, uh, ICE US, which posts about 100 million, that's 10.2%, 10, 10, right? So you're seeing this just this inconsistency uh, in terms of what's determined as the right level of skin in the game. Uh, and I think that's where we, we can probably do a better job in terms of looking at uh, better understanding how those models are determined, better understanding, um, you know, um, what that consistency should look like in terms of the right amount of skin in the game. Um, and that's, by the way, not even discussing non-default losses, which is a whole nother topic. So, uh, you know, I, I do think that uh, skin in the game in and of itself is a very hard question to answer in a, in a minute and a half. But... Uh, I, I think it's something that maybe we need to shift a little bit to focusing more on the consistency and the understanding and the transparency as opposed to the argument we've, that's been happening but not really getting too far in terms of, you know, is there enough? Shall I come in quickly? The, yes, the, the, the definitive word on non-default loss, on the definitive word on non-default losses is in the paper I just circulated. Roll up, roll up, take a look. I don't, I, 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 I disagree, Jason, because I don't think that there's been enough of a case made for consistency. I think there are reasons why the, the, the amount of skin in the game may legitimately vary depending on the nature of the market and the, the maturity mm -hmm. of it and the maturity of clearing in that service. There's a very, very good paper, which I think anybody who, who, who wants to discuss this further should, should read. And this is not a point to you, Jason. It's not a very well-known paper. The Reserve Bank of Australia put out a fantastic paper on the role of skin in the game and actually buried in a footnote. Uh, there's a very interesting discussion about one instance of why it might vary. So I, I think I think the, 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 the case is, is yet to be proven on that. Be very happy to discuss that at greater length bilaterally or, or on another one hour coffee break. Who knows? <laughs> Great <Yeah>. idea, Richard. <laughs> and, and Lisa, final thoughts? You know, it's... Um... We're not we're not going back. I don't think we're going back to a bilateral OTC world, right? That that ship has sailed. And so this new yeah. this bilateral OTC credit risk will not have a place, but it will have a place in our ecosystem. It's just that it's shrinking. And so these types mm -hmm. of topics where we're talking about clearing houses and, and their their safety or are they too big to fail or skin in the game are all really important. And I think that as each of our respective risk management teams that 
buy side and clearinghouse and FCMs all come together to review data, I think it's important to keep these conversations open. I know, for example, SIFMA Asset Managers Group has been, um, you know, has been working with different CCPs on their financial disclosures and getting more, um, more consistency there so that the intake of information can be a little bit more apples to apples. And that's just one example of how I think we're all moving in the right direction. Okay. Maureen, is there time to uh, handle some of the questions from our uh, audience? I th well, we're at 1101, so I know I'm conscious of everybody's time, but it sounds like we need a follow-up episode anyway. We can get into <laughs> some of these topics more. We didn't talk about the technology aspect, but um, we are at yeah, the top of the hour, and it's good to see Richard again uh, before we close. Yeah, just give me just give me 20 minutes in that follow-up session to, uh, to re <laughs> rebut uh, No problem. Self. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just have you on. We'll just have you on, Jason. Bring it, bring it, Razik. Um, <laughs> um, but on that night, I would like to really thank our panelists. This was a great discussion. Um, thank you, Lisa, Richard, and Jason for joining us today and to all our attendees thank who you. are watching from all our various channels today. Um, we had some interesting questions. Um, this is the last episode in our summer series of FTF Coffee Breaks. We're going to take a little bit of a break ourselves and resume in the fall. So if there are any other topics or if you would like us to delve further into this one, please feel free to shoot me an email and let me know what topics that would be helpful for you to discuss. And um, thanks again to everyone. And we hope to see everybody in person sometime soon. And yes, thank you. And uh, yeah. we will seriously consider part two. Part two. <laughs> Great. Thanks so much, right. everyone. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank, Thanks. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.